Hello everyone. Welcome to today's session on a gentle introduction to reinforcement learning and its application. I'm pleased to welcome you all for the second technical webinar organized by IEEE Young Professionals Windsor section. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome Professor Matthew E. Taylor, Director, Intelligent Robot Learning Lab and Associate Professor Computer Science at the University of Alberta for accepting the invitation to be the speaker of today's event. I would also like to welcome Dr. Vijayan, Dr. Kotishwaran from St. Joseph's College of Engineering for joining this event. Once again, I welcome you all for this event and now over to Professor Matt for the presentation. Can you stop screen sharing your screen? Yeah. There we go. Okay, did that work? Yes. So if at any point you uh, can't see the screen or uh, can no longer hear me, please just yell. Uh, I would prefer this to be interactive. So if you have questions or comments at any point, please unmute yourself and just yell it out. I will also be trying to watch the chat window. But it's a... Uh, uh, because of my current setup, I'm looking at you and the chat window's over there, so it may be a little slow. So please feel free to interrupt me at any point. And I do go, I do prefer to go by Matt. If you would like to call me Professor Taylor, that, that's acceptable, but I prefer Matt. All right, so getting started. Um, I call this a gentle introduction, not because you could not handle a severe introduction, but I wanted to um, emphasize that this is actually a really accessible area of study, and I wanted to try to get you excited about it. The first goal is to try to understand how reinforcement learning, or RL, is different from other types of more commonly deployed reinforcement learning. Hopefully, you'll get a sense of what an RL problem looks like, have some sense of why it's hard, but then I'll go through a few case studies to really show you what an RL problem is and hopefully convince you that it's a cool topic worth learning more about. And finally, I will also present a bunch of material where you can learn more about RL. So if you do not have time or access to a reinforcement learning class, there's a bunch of free material on the web, which I can recommend. So let's get started. As many of you know, artificial intelligence has been going on for a long time, since the 50s. And we generally think about it as a computational technology that can accomplish some task that we think, well, that, that should require some cognitive ability. So there's been things like expert systems. We're gonna be talking about machine learning. There's also AGI, thinking about, can I come up with an artificial general intelligence that could do lots of different tasks at a human level? And currently, we're not really sure if that's achievable or how long, how long far away it is. That's kind of more sci-fi now. Right now, a lot of the work is looking at how do we get high performance on a single task. And just to remind, uh, many of you have probably heard this story before. In the 60s, one of the founding fathers of AI was saying, well, figure out vision. That should take you a summer, right? It didn't take a summer. We're, we're still working on it. Let's see, so I uh, received David Roger. Yeah, so thinking about how the um, agents or robots receive the data is absolutely important. And one of the things I won't be talking about in this lecture, but representation learning in machine learning is really important. So figuring out if I am acting on data, which is what machine learning does, it's a statistical method, which takes in data and acts on it, how I uh, think about that data, how I interact with that data is super important. And right now, most people kind of conflate machine learning with artificial intelligence. And machine learning is really a type of AI, which happens to be dominant right now, often using neural networks. So you can think of three kind of flavors of AI. The first is supervised learning. So thinking I have uh, camels and cows, I want to be able, if you show me a picture, I'm gonna tell you whether there is a camel or a cow in there. 
Um, or maybe uh, instead of uh, classification, it's numeric. So I am going to show you a picture of a, a bunch of money and you need to tell me how much money is on the table. There's also unsupervised learning where you do not have a correct or incorrect label, but you're just kind of trying to figure out this data. So let's say you've got um, millions of credit card transactions and you could try to figure out which of those credit transactions are similar to each other and maybe say, ooh, actually, I think these are fraud. So there's not necessarily uh, a, a someone telling you these are the different types or clusters, but you need to look at the data and figure it out. In contrast to this, what we'll be talking about today, reinforcement learning or RL, is very agent focused. So an agent is a virtual or physical thing that interacts with the world around it. So the agent can take some action. So a robot could take a step in the world and then the environment determines what happens next. If the robot takes a step forward, maybe the, the robot winds up in a state that is one foot ahead of it. So after you take an action, the environment tells you where you are, you're in a new state and gives you some reward and the agent is going to try to maximize that word. Oh, and uh, so there's self-supervised learning. Um, so there's also semi-supervised learning. So there's a bunch of different um, uh, settings that aren't actually covered by these three main uh, categorizations, but hopefully you'll get a sense of how RL is different, particularly in terms of this agent that has to act with the environment. So we're never, um, told whether they're right or wrong labels. So think about this. If I am driving to school and I want to minimize my time to the school, I could take a bunch of uh, actions, turn left, turn right, avoid this intersection. And I'm never told, oh, actually you took, you took 15 minutes. You could have gone 13 minutes. You don't know that. No, no one is coming and telling you the right solution. Instead, you're just kind of interacting with the world and trying to figure out what to do. And there are absolutely model learning methods. So thinking about if I want to drive to school, maybe I should learn a model of the world of how, you know, normally this intersection is slow, this hill is bad during winter. So maybe I want to want to avoid that. Well, what we'll be talking about today is not specific to model-based or model-free, but just trying to learn how to interact with this. So we are going to interact with either a simulator or the real world. We're gonna gather data. So as I'm driving to school over time, I get all of this information about what I did and how long it took. And I want to try to maximize some reward or equivalently minimize the cost. So I could try to minimize my time. Um, let's see, so another thing that's different about this agent setting is that I need to think about exploring versus exploiting. So for instance, I'm driving to school and now a new road opens up. I could continue going along my, my preferred route, or I might try this new road to see if it's faster. So I can either try to do new things or I could try to do what I think is best. And maybe I go on that new road once and it was a little bit slower. Should I rule it out for all time? Or should I think about trying it again because I don't have a very good estimate of time? Or should I think about trying it a few times over time because maybe during the summer they pave it and maybe during the winter things change? Natural language processing could be useful for reinforcement learning. So for instance, you can use RL to help you process natural language, but you can also think of natural language kind of being the state of a world. So if you had an RL agent, you had a, you had a chat bot that was trying to interact with a person, maybe the state of the world would be the, the, the words that person had said. And now you can say, oh, well, based on those words, I think you mean you would like to speak to a customer service representative because chatbots are often garbage. Um, okay, so another thing you could think about is we could model opponents or maybe model a person you're working with. You could communicate with other people. You could communicate with other agents. Those agents could be on your team. So think of playing a soccer game 
Or you could think of um, communicating with people that aren't really on your team, but maybe it's useful. So if there's a bunch of cars and all of those cars are in traffic, I don't really care whether Joe gets to work faster or not, but if I can communicate with him and improve myself and maybe him as well, that could be worth it. You could also think about full observability. Do I see the world perfectly? Or for instance, if I'm playing StarCraft or Dota, and I could only, I think Dota is partially observable. Uh, if I'm playing StarCraft or I'm playing poker, I cannot see the whole world. I can't see other people's hands. And today we're mostly gonna be talking about control. How do I learn to collect this reward? But you could also think about predicting. So saying, I just perform, I, I have this policy. I'm going to follow this policy, a way of acting. And do I think it's working well or not? So supervised learning applications, machine learning is taking the world by storm. And a lot of that is supervised learning and unsupervised learning. But there are a growing number of RL applications. Some of the really um, hot ones that have been getting lots of news are things like AlphaGo, where reinforcement learning beat a world-class Go player, but also things like video games, AlphaStar and OpenAI 5. But there's also many other applications. And one of the things I am trying to, to go out to the non-academic community and say reinforcement learning is a mature technology that can go beyond video games. So we will give an example later in energy. And I was just talking about how transportation might be useful, but it's also been used in a bunch of places. For instance, it has been used in natural language processing like we just talked about. It's been used a lot in robotics. It's also been used in computer systems. So trying to optimize the computer for reinforcement via reinforcement learning. And I have done a little work on reinforcement learning and finance. So there are lots of places that RL can be useful. So this talk is, is in part trying to help uh, understand where those opportunities might be, might be uh, present. I know RL has been used in cybersecurity, but since that's not my area, I'm not exactly sure where it's been used. The main thing is if you have an agent that's interacting with an environment. So if I'm just looking at logs and trying to say that's an intruder, that's not, that's just supervised learning. If I am looking at logs and trying to say, ooh, this looks suspicious, I'm gonna present a challenge to this user, or, oh man, this, this doesn't seem right, I'm going to take this preventative action and then contact an administrator, then that might be a setting for RL. And games are very a very good domain to test reinforcement learning because everything is controlled. But as we'll talk about a little bit later, as we go into the real world, things get a lot more complex. So things like stationarity and noise will absolutely play a, play a role. So on the right is this uh, fairly ugly uh, sketch that I drew, where we're saying along the x-axis is the amount of time or, or data I'm using, and along the y-axis is my performance, my reward. And we want to accumulate more reward over time. And in this case, you might say, well, the black line is better because it achieves a higher end performance. But if this data or if this time is very expensive, then maybe you would prefer the red line. Maybe you would want to perform well initially as fast as possible. So we can think about maximizing the final performance. We can think about minimizing data, maybe reducing human effort. So I could either hand code something or I could get reinforcement learning to learn for me. You can also think about novel solutions. If people have the answer, why not let a person hand code something? In the case of uh, a few years ago, there was a uh, RoboCup. So it's an international competition. They were using dogs and these little robotic dogs. It ends up that crawling on their arms, crawling on their elbows and forearms was much faster than walking on their paws, just the way this robot was designed. So that's the kind of thing that a human might not think of, but an RL algorithm might find. And also non-stationary environments. So for instance, if I'm doing stock trading and the environment is changing over time, I better change with it. Uh, yep, and thinking about feedback from ensembles. So thinking about what, what does this reward mean? 
Exactly. So if I if I am getting a reward from if I have multiple reward signals or I'm getting a reward from a, a person and an environment, thinking about how to combine that feedback, thinking about what that feedback means is something else we'll talk about in a little bit. So thank keep keep the questions coming. This is great. So a bit of history, reinforcement learning has a background in kind of psychology, thinking about, oh, I want to I want to maximize this dopamine signal. I'm just an animal trying to get the most dopamine that I can. And there's not a whole lot of feedback. So in supervised learning, you look at something and say, oh, I think that is uh, $32 on the table in this picture. And then someone comes back and says, no, that was actually $63. In reinforcement learning, we just get this feedback that could be very sparse. So maybe you don't get the feedback about how you're doing until you reach school. You, your driving time is not known until you actually get there, but it is very flexible. Um, how mature is RL in non-stationary environments? That's a great question. That is definitely an open question. Um, one of the nice things about reinforcement learning is whether when you say how good it is, that always depends on what you're comparing to. And if you are comparing to a fixed hand-coded program that someone has written, hopefully RL will be able to outperform that. And you can absolutely think of uh, data structures. So instead of a single reward, maybe multiple rewards. So when I'm driving to school, maybe I want to minimize time and minimize fuel while maximizing safety. So I can think about all of those. Uh, Dr. you right. And... Can you use RL to extract features out of sensor data? Possible. If you can, if this is an iterative process. So one, one thing RL has been used for is trying to figure out how to add features or remove features over time and try to do that efficiently. So that, that might be related to the question about uh, sensor data. So we've been talking about reinforcement learning. Now I'm gonna go into something much simpler. Multi-armed bandits. So for those, for those of you who have, who have not been gambling before, if you go gamble at Las Vegas, for instance, you can see a row of machines where you go up and can pull this arm. And you might think, well, maybe, maybe this machine is hot. Maybe this machine is gonna pay out more. So I could go along the row and try to figure out which machine is best. Now, of course, when I when I pull this machine, it's not going to give me the same answer every time. So there's going to be some some distribution that I need to figure out. And I mentioned this before, thinking about do I want to try a new arm or do I want to try an old arm? Because if I am putting my money in every time I'm pulling my arm, every time I'm exploring and trying a new arm, in some sense, I might be losing something because I am not pulling the arm that I think is best. So now let me go switch to a simple example. So let's say I've, I only have two arms. I have two bandits in front of me. And let's say I pull arm one and then I pull arm two. Okay, so it looks like arm one is better. So now I can pull arm one, ooh. Well, based on the last one, it's worse. So if I just look at the last value, arm two is better. So I could pull arm two. Oh man, that's garbage. Uh, now let's pull arm one. That's even worse. By the way, this is random. This isn't uh, me just put, putting in pre-programmed numbers. Pull arm two. Oh wow, that's really good. So now I've got some data. How do I figure out which arm is better? Well, I could do something simple like the average. Okay, so based on this, arm two is the best. So I could decide to pull that forever, or I might still want to try arm one. Ooh, actually it's three, 3.1 and four. So you could do something like, what's the average? But there are many more sophisticated things you could do, like looking at the standard deviation, looking at confidence bounds over these different arms. What if you don't, what if instead of two arms, you have an infinite number of arms? So there's lo a lot of rich um, a theory and practice around multi-arm bandits, but this is all in one state of the world. You are, we are assuming you're sitting in front of these machines and you're pulling arms and the arm you pulled previously 
does not affect which arm is the best to pull next. Whereas in reinforcement learning, the decisions you take over time change where you are in the world and change what you should do next. Compl uh, so someone just asked, can we determine if output is good or not based on time complexity? Can you say a little bit more? Maybe, maybe you'd be willing to unmute your mic and say what you mean by based on time complexity? Uh, hi, Matt. Uh, this is Tarun. Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, like uh, you just mentioned uh, that uh, uh, we uh, the RID can work uh, on uh, various uh, algos, right? Uh, on various algorithms. So uh, we know uh, that we can uh, calculate the time complexity, uh, like the uh, the best we can get uh, from each. So, uh, like, do you suggest like we can determine if the output uh, is good, like uh, that RL is giving a good result if uh, it is uh, giving us the best time complexity uh, based on that? Yeah. So in in the bandit case, you can often do that. So you can think about. Um, so I usually it's usually referred to as data complexity. So thinking about how many times do I need to pull each arm before I'm sure that one is better than the other. But you could also think about time complexity. So if if I need to act in real time, if my robot is taking actions in the world and I need to spend five minutes thinking about what to do between actions, that's probably not going to be very, very practical. Um, OK, and then there's a specific question about which algorithms might be better. And that is completely up in the air. So right now, my favorite um, reinforcement learning is either PPO or SAC. So uh, prox priority, um, I just remember this, uh, the examples, the uh, acronym. So my favorite are PPO and SAC. But anytime you want to do reinforcement learning, you probably want to go and start by downloading somebody else's algo and seeing how well it works. Thank you. Proximal, proximal policy optimization is what PPO is. SAC is soft after critic. OK, I did this. OK, so we talked about bandits. Now we're going into RL. So now I've got my Wally, and Wally can take an action. And let's say we normally want to go like this because if I go like that, I get this plus one at the end and I avoid this negative one. So that seems like a reasonable policy. So a policy when I'm in the lower left could, could be, be to go up. And when I'm in the upper left corner, then I'm gonna to wanna to go right. Okay, so how do we think about this? Well, I can say there are 12 states. There are 12 places I could be. I could go up, down, left, or right. And I can't go through walls, but there's also a small chance I could slip. So for instance, if I am trying to go up where Wally is, there is some small chance I might slip and go to the right. There is a reward function. I want to get to the plus one, or I could get a minus one. There's also a small step penalty. So I want to get there quickly. The policy I want to learn is mapping states to actions. In this state, what do I want to do? If we knew that all that information, if we knew the states, if we knew the transition function and the reward, if we knew all of that a priori, then I could just solve via planning where the reward function determines what the, be the best behavior is. So if I've got some uh, moderate step penalty, then the thing I wanna do is go up and around the top. And if I'm down at the bottom, I probably just want to go to the left to tr minimize the chances that I can get this negative one. But you could think of other step penalties too. So if I had a much smaller step penalty, then in the lower right, the best thing to do is go down. Why is that? Because if I go left, there is a small chance of me slipping and going up into the negative one. So similarly, Similarly, in next to the wall, I want to keep running into that wall because eventually I'll either go up or down. If I try to go up from that spot, there's a small chance that I would go to the right and hit the negative one. On the other hand, there could be a large penalty. So this I like to think of as the grad student situation. 
uh, you are in so much pain, you just want to get your thesis done, even if you get that negative one. So if you're in one of these states, oh man, this is so hard, just let it end. Um, that, that was sarcasm. I actually really enjoyed my, my, my time in grad school. But you can see how having these different reward functions, by definition, changes what's optimal. So if we know all of this information about the rewards, transition function states, all of this, then we can use planning and figure out how to act optimally. Could you use RL for domain adaptation in data constraint scenarios? Could you use RL to uh, force constraint scenarios for low latency processing? So possibly. So if, um, if you're thinking about domain ad adaptation, because we can deal with non-stationary, did he generity? That is exactly right. You could also think of a multi uh, multitask setting where I'm trying, for instance, let's say I've got an agent that I want to learn over all three of these tasks. And then the agent can figure out, oh, uh, I, I can figure out what my step penalty is and then deploy the right reward. Or maybe now I get a step penalty of negative one per time step. Could I synthesize my existing policies and then guess a new good policy. So that was a very simple RL setting. Let's make things a little more interesting. Instead of having 12 states, we could have an infinite number of states. You could also have continuous actions. When you're operating a robot, you typically have torques. You're not thinking about up, down, left, right. Maybe you don't know the transition function. Maybe you only get the reward at the very end. Maybe it's uh, randomized. And we've still got to learn this policy. Um, uh, someone commented that they are incoming uh, thesis student at U of A, and they are so excited that uh, I uh, pointed out that grad school is constant pain. Um, so yes, I am, ex I am excited um, for all these new students that are starting their, their thesis projects now that it's fall. So, one example, so I was saying, you know, video games, uh, reinforcement learning does well in video games, but it's useful in a lot of other places. I'm going to start off by showing you a video game. So hopefully you, a few years ago, some of you saw this. This was a fad, um, Flappy Bird. So in Flappy Bird, you have to try to fly through these pipes. And this was, a, I think it was on both iPhone and Android. So you are trying to fly through these pipes, and every time you hit the pipe or hit the ground, you go back to the beginning. And in this case, this poor bird, it's so confused. Reinforcement learning typically starts out with a random policy. With a random policy, this bird is not doing very well. But I'm going to fast forward to about 30 minutes. After 30 minutes of training, now the agent here is passing almost 150 pipes. So 30 minutes of real time, and it's doing better than I ever could. But let's let's go all the way to like two and a half hours. Now this bird has learned how to go through thousands of pipes. So this is one example of where reinforcement learning can easily outperform a human. So you might think, okay, this is this is actually kind of confusing. How is this bird making these decisions? So okay, let's think. The transition function is controlled by the game. In this case, uh, the bird can either be falling or flapping, but it's always going to the right. The action in Flappy Bird is you pressing the screen. If you press the screen, press the screen, the bird flaps. If you don't press the screen, the bird doesn't flap. Surprisingly, there are a number of, of apps on, on uh, phones where there is one but one thing you can do, which is press the screen. And surprisingly, those games are actually kind of fun. The reward could be just you passed through a pipe, good job, plus one. What do you think would be a reasonable state representation? How could this bird, what does this bird need to know in order to, to decide whether to flap or not? Would someone be willing to take a guess either in the chat window or unmute? Uh, hi, Matt. I'd like to take a guess. Please. Uh, yeah. So my guess would be uh, it's relative location to the next pipes, which could be done using computer vision or could be directly fed to the model. Okay. Awesome. So we could think about the distance to the next pipe. And then someone else said the image, right? So we could look at all the pixels 
and someone else said the XY location. So the other thing we can think about, we could think about the distance to the ground, or we could think about the Y distance to the bottom of the next pipe. So great, thank you for doing that. Um, oh, you could also think about the history. So if I had the history of what I've seen before, that might help me. But one of the things you try to do in reinforcement learning is just look at right now, what do I need to know? If I don't need to worry about my history, things are so much easier. So in this case, we could actually just think of the distance actually to the end of the next pipe and the distance to the bottom of the pipe. And with just those two numbers, the agent can learn to act optimally. So that was Flappy Bird. A big step up was going to Atari. So in Atari, when the uh, Atari learning environment, the ALE was first um, uh, introduced, there were lots of hand coded representations. So again, we could think like, well, if I'm trying to move this paddle up and down, where what is my Y position on the screen, maybe relative to the ball. So how far away is the ball from me in terms of X and Y? Um, and if you want instead to learn over pixels, that's what DeepMind did in around 2014, 2015. So that was a real breakthrough. So now instead of reasoning over these simple hand-coded features, now we can reason over pixels. And I can take actions based on the joystick, transition functions determined by the game, and the reward function is determined by the game. So if you can reason over um, these the state representation perfectly, then the situation is Markov. So for instance, if I could look at this picture on the left and decide, should I go up, should I move my paddle up or down, then the state would be Markov. In this case, this representation is not a Markov representation. I need to know what was the last position of the ball. So if the last position is position of the ball was up and to the left versus down and to the left, I would need to take very different um, behaviors. So one thing you could do is what's called frame stacking. Instead of looking at a single frame, let me look at a sequence of frames. So that way I don't need to keep, the agent doesn't need to keep track of the history. It's actually the, the, the small amount of history I need is now presented for me as part of the state. So that, that's kind of cheating, but it works. Um, I will, uh, someone asked a specific question about Unity and ML. That person should probably write me an email um, because that's not a quick answer. If you go to, again, my website is irll.ca and you can find a link to my website and my email there. So playing Atari was a real breakthrough and they did this through deep neural nets. So if you hadn't heard of this, some people think of deep neural networks as equivalent to machine learning, and that's not true. It is just one way of doing machine learning that happens to be extremely powerful and in vogue now. They aren't real neurons, but they're kind of biologically based. And people have been using neural networks for decades, but now with these deep learning technologies, because we have better compute, uh, better algorithms, now we can make many more layers. And deep learning is great when you have big data sets. If I have an Atari agent, which can play for days, I can get a really big data set. Deep learning is great at perception. So things like images, audio, uh, video. Deep learning is often not great at memory, um, not great at planning. It's also not great at counting. So if you show an image and say, uh, how many elephants are in this image? that can be hard for it. Or if you say, uh, how, many, uh, how many elephants would be in this image if two more walked in? That would be hard for a deep neural network. Let me give you a third example. And this is the first kind of real world example that I wanna bring up where DeepMind controlled a server farm, a data center. So I've got all this equipment and the equipment, how I use it, and the environment all interact. I want to quickly adapt to changes. If there's a, a, a hot spell, or if suddenly there's a new competition and I have a lot more people using my data service, I want to be able to react to that. 
And each of these data centers are unique. They are going to have different characteristics. So what you could do is say, well, I've got this state. So I've got some sensors about maybe temperature, pump speed, set points, but also things like the amount of usage currently. Uh, are they high CPU, high GPU? And then for the actions, maybe I'd want to turn on and off different machines. That, that's something that could work. And then what we reward for is has to do with efficiency. How much of my energy am I spending on cooling versus doing something useful? And again, the transition function is the real world. So this was a cool example of reinforcement learning used to be more energy efficient. The final example I'll show is learning an exercise policy for American options. So this is actually, I think about 11 or 12 years ago. So for those of you who don't do finance, you can think of um, an option is a call or a put to say, I want to buy or sell an asset by a certain date for a certain price. So for instance, let's say uh, Google is selling for $100 now, and I want, I'm want i gonna pay to have the ability to buy this at $100 anytime within the next month. If the price of Google goes down to $50, I could exercise this option and buy it at $100 and I would lose $50. So that makes no sense. I would not exercise the option there. If I gave myself the option to buy it at $100 and Google went up to $150, then I could exercise that option, buy at 100, sell at 150 and immediately make $50. So I could decide during that month period, do I want to exercise this option or not? And that's a type of stopping problem. In this case, a finite horizon optimal stopping problem. So we, we can think of this, so I know I know the price I bought it at, I know how much time is left, and I know the current price, so that's my state. The action is binary, do I exercise or not? And then the rewards are based on the outcome, and then the transition function is either uh, data from a fake, either past data from the market, a simulator for the market, or the current real market, in all of those cases, I could try to learn a policy that tells me, should I execute this option or not? The interesting thing about this is once I know, once I have an option execution policy, then the, um, the finance nerds can go and figure out how much this option should be sold for. So this is actually a, a relatively uh, important thing. So it's another example of how reinforcement learning can be used for the real world for something that people really care about. Okay, so we've got uh, about 19 minutes left. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on what I am doing current research on, both because I think it's the most, awesome, the most interesting research, I'm totally unbiased there, uh, but also just to give you a sense of some of the cool things that people are working on. So, I personally have been um, staring at this diagram for about uh, eight years now. And typically you think of an agent is just interacting with an environment. That agent is learning to play Atari. And what I decided to focus my research on is thinking about how could a person help teach that agent? Or how could one agent help teach another? How could one robot help teach another? Well, if these robots were close enough, you could just take the brain out of the trained agent and put it into the new agent. But sometimes that's not possible. Maybe you would want an agent to teach another one. So for instance, a trained teacher agent could watch a student agent and say, oh, you're playing Pac-Man, go up now. Or you're playing Pac-Man, you need to stay away from ghosts. So think about how could you convey this kind of information to help another agent and there's also work on intelligent tutoring systems. So we've been thinking of doing a little bit of work, but also thinking about how a trained agent could help a person to learn some task. So we'd, we'd like to be able to learn from these different sources of information, whether it's an agent or a person, but these sources of information are likely suboptimal. I can give a demonstration in Atari or Mario or StarCraft, which is much better than random, but I am by no means an expert. We would like the agent to be able to outperform that advice or help or demonstration that it originally receives. 
And an important thing to note is this help, if it's a person, shouldn't just be coming from computer scientists. So there's a nice study done, I think about 15 years ago, where people uh, were teaching uh, robots to do things, learning from demonstration. So people would come in and get the robot to learn how to pick up a bowl. And all of these methods worked really well. You don't get to publish a paper unless they work well. But then somebody else did a retrospective saying, what if we don't have roboticists helping the robot? What if we have just normal people helping the robot? And in that case, they found very different behavior. So one of the things I'm interested in and, ma and many others in the field is thinking about how suboptimal um, sub help, but also how non-technical people can help. So if I'm giving a demonstration, you can probably have a non-technical person help out an agent by playing Mario. Or you might be able to give action advice. You should go up now, up now. You should go left now. And you could think of, well, we teach dogs by giving feedback. Good dog, bad dog. Why not say good robot, bad robot? So we've also looked at that. Another thing could be preferences. Show two agents playing um, Atari and just say which one is better. And you can learn pretty fast doing that. But you could think of many other things. So giving natural language feedback giving high-level advice, stay away from the cliff, things like that. Yeah, so uh, one agent helping another to learn. If those agents are close enough, I can do transfer learning. So just take the brain out of one agent and adapt it to the other one. But if they are too different, then I might not be able to do transfer learning because they just don't have that robust uh, communication channel or they are just so different, then, then I won't be able to transfer. Uh, yeah, so in normal reinforcement learning, typically the reward comes down from the environment. So the environment is telling you, oh, you just got plus one because you got an extra point. And in this case, we may want a human to help us, or maybe that reward is only coming from the human instead of the environment. And it is absolutely related to um, to uh, imitation learning. So imitation learning is very similar to learning from demonstration. Great, thank you. So when we think about getting help, we could say, well, I've got, I've got this novice agent, so I've got a student and I've got a teacher. When should there be help? Well, the teacher has more knowledge. Maybe the teacher should say, student, you're getting close to the cliff, stay away from the cliff. But on the other hand, the student knows what's going on in its head. So maybe the student needs to say, oh, wow, I really, I really don't know what to do here. Hey, teacher, can you help me out? And there's this nice paper out of, um, uh, out of, uh, from Ofra, Amir and um, Microsoft, looking at how you could combine both of these, where a student could ask for help and or a teacher could provide help. But you could also think of how explainability could be useful. So if the teacher was a human, it seems like if the teacher knew what was going on in the student agent's head, it could provide better advice. So my student, Britt, a master student, is trying to look at if we make our student agent more explainable, or if we make our reinforcement learning agent explainable in general, how does that help a human interact with that agent or maybe provide advice to that agent? And we could think of when could one type of help be preferred. So for instance, if I, I could play Atari and give a good demonstration, I could not fly a helicopter. But if I'm watching a simulated helicopter and that helicopter crashes, I could say that was bad. If that helicopter seems to be hovering well, I could say that was good. Similarly, if I wanted to play Atari, but it was really fast, instead of 30 frames per second, maybe it's going 120 frames per second then that's so fast, I'm probably not going to be able to give a good demonstration, but I could still give, hey, that was good, that was bad, or this was better than that. So this, this information is not as robust, it's harder to learn from, but it's still possible to provide. You could also think of, what if the, what if the help is not unlimited? So it turns out, if you ask a human, could you please give me 10,000 pieces of advice, that human will look at you and say no and walk away. So if the human is only willing to say, give you a hundred piece of, pieces of advice, how do you figure out where to use those? So one thing you could do is, is say, I am going to ask advice where I am most confused. So this is something we did recently 
where we said when the student is confused, most confused, that's when it's going to ask the teacher for help. And it can only ask until it runs out of this budget. And this is a relatively simple approach, but it actually works quite well. But you could also think there's a cost. So let's say I am going to, to have someone play Atari for me. And every, every five minutes, I need to give them $5. So how much money do I want to, to pay this person? Well, let's think of going back to the multi-arm bandit setting. Let's say I've got uh, multiple arms and I'm actually making money off of these arms. And I could ask an oracle. I could ask a person who uh, has programmed these machines, what is the payoff of arm one? Now, based on the payoffs I'm getting, I could figure out, oh, if the difference between these different arms are, is likely just pennies, and this person I need to give a bribe of $100 to, it's probably not worth it. But if the difference between these arms could be dollars, and this person is willing to give me some information for very little, then it's probably worth asking for help. But trying to figure out what to ask for help about and when to ask for help is definitely ongoing research. Um, so we're looking at human labor and interest efficiency, but tuning machines could help human labor. Um, yeah, so absolutely. Uh, in financial markets, so there's there's a bunch of, I should be careful. RL is used in finance, absolutely. I do not know of places where this kind of getting help is being used, but that was one of my motivations. If you are stock trading, you do not want your reinforcement learning agent starting from scratch, random. Instead, you want to get help from expert traders and you want to get help from existing programs because they have already probably hand-coded some way of making stock trades. Awesome, thank you uh, for, for remembering our work. Um, and then finally, what if there are multiple students? So for instance, let's say I've got a team of agents and I could help one agent but that means I am not helping others. Or if I'm helping the general team, so I'm watching a soccer team saying, everyone go up. That general advice could help the entire team, but I'm not giving specific advice to one player on that team. So we're also thinking about that. Everything gets more complicated in the multi-agent setting. That's true in general. All right, so. If you would like to learn more about reinforcement learning, and this uh, this slide will be on the on the final slide as well. So if you would like to take a screenshot, you're welcome to now or later. I'll also make these slides available. If you would like to more learn more about RL, my favorite um, is this class. So this class comes from U of A. I'm obviously biased, um, but it's kind of at the intermediate level where you can learn a lot about reinforcement learning. If you are in, interested in taking a class online, another one you could check out is this one. It's a little bit older, but I really like the two professors who uh, teach it. They obviously are having a, a, a really enjoying themselves. It is uh, there are a number of jokes? It's lighthearted, so that makes it um, a little bit easier, more fun to digest. If you are looking for something a little more complex, so if you want to do more self learning, this is the book on reinforcement learning. If you search for reinforcement learning, Sutton and Bartow, that is the book on reinforcement learning. And it's so, so I joined the U of A in April. I'm relatively new there. And I am still getting over the fact that I am colleagues with Rich Sutton. That is just so exciting to me. Um, also, if you are more mathematical, Chaba has a nice book that is uh, very short. It's a hundred, I think about a hundred pages and super focused on algorithms that are, it's a little bit math heavy. If these, these are all great for reinforcement learning, which is where I would encourage you to start. If you want to jump into deep reinforcement learning, then I'd recommend the YouTube channel from UCL and DeepMind or OpenAI. So I think it's better to start with the fundamentals, but if you are more interested in, I wanna, I wanna see how, how to get an agent running an Atari, then you could go jump into these deep deep reinforcement learning, learning materials. And then if you if you find it exciting enough, then go back to the fundamentals. Um, do you advise adept knowledge and supervise and unsupervised learning? Um, so 
you can absolutely, I think you can learn about reinforcement learning without learning about other kinds of machine learning, at least initially. When you get further into reinforcement learning, you will absolutely need to learn about uh, supervised learning. But to start, I, I started reinforcement learning from more from an AI stance. So thinking about, I've got this cool agent that's playing video games. I didn't learn a lot of machine learning until later. And also, which course is good for an intermediate level graduate student? Oh, good question. So most of the material on eh, most of the material on this page is good for introduction. If you want an intermediate level, then well, there's obviously a good class or a couple of good classes at U of A. Um, but beyond that, there are some more in-depth textbooks. Beyond that introduction, you're probably going to want to go to either a specific textbook or start diving into papers, depending on exactly what you want to study. So summing up, reinforcement learning can help an agent learn to maximize these rewards. The programmer just has to specify goals. There's often much less work than hand coding to often outperform humans, and you can handle unanticipated changes. There are, however, some weaknesses. Your agent is going to maximize your reward, whether that's what you want, whether that's what you want, whether that is ethical, whether that is safe, whether that is legal, it's just going to maximize this reward. So for instance, if you're trying to beat a video game, but tell the agent to collect points, the agent might find a reward cycle where now the agent can get lots and lots of points without moving very far and never finishes the reward. It can also require lots of computation or time interacting with the real world. So if you have an RL robot that has to learn from scratch, that can not only be very slow, but you also may have to re replace the battery and repair parts and change servos. It can be really annoying. If you're in finance, if you have to explore, if you have to learn a lot from scratch, you can be losing money on the fly. One thing a lot of people are actively, Many pe some people, some people are actively working on is explainability. We really don't want it to be a black box. We'd like to be able to explain how our agent works. And going back to the cost, the initial performance can be poor. So that's a lot what having another agent or another human can help you with. So with that, I think I'm going to stop here. Here again are the references I recommended. If and you are always welcome to get in touch with me. My e you can find my email at my course webpage, or excuse me, at my group webpage. And with that, I think we've got about five minutes left for questions. If people would like to drop more questions in the links, and sorry, in the chat, I do appreciate you continually dropping the chat questions there. Or feel free to unmute. Um, please, what, what questions or comments do people have at this point? Uh, so there's a question I, I didn't mention, I probably should have. I am teaching a graduate course on interactive machine learning. So how a human and a machine learning agent can work together or learn from each other. That is available online and completely free. That requires that you have at least what I recommend you have at least one class in uh, machine learning. So I will not be teaching the very basics of machine learning. But if you are, if you have that basis and are interested in interacting with humans, this course, this graduate course is available for free. And again, you can find a link to that at IRLL.ca. Um, can you speak more about RL and finance? There's right, the non-stationarity and noise are, are constant problems. Um, I do not know what hedge funds are using reinforcement learning for, but I can say that lots of hedge funds and finance companies are seem to be hiring and recruiting reinforcement learning like crazy. So I believe RL is being used in practice, but you're never going to get, almost never, probably never going to get a hedge fund to tell you how they are using a specific technology. Um, yep, you absolutely can need a big learning set for reinforcement learning. Um, I, I will send my slides to Harry and he, Harry, and he can tell you how to, how to get access to them. RL is being used in autonomous driving, 
And there's something uh, interesting has to do with safety. So how can you try to keep RL safe? How can I help to make sure that RL does not want to explore by driving into a tree? Because that is not an acceptable exploration uh, exploration action. And I know uh, RL people have been working at Uber and other, other companies, how exactly they're using it, I'm not sure. But you think about it, you've got a car, it's taking actions, there's a state, seems like it should be useful there. Um, recent ideas in MARL, so multi-agent reinforcement learning. So last year, I believe, we released a survey on deep multi-agent reinforcement learning. And again, completely unbiased, uh, but because I wrote it, uh, helped write it, I think that's a great resource. So if you go to the IRLL webpage and go to publications and search for survey, and you can see that. And although we focus on deep learning, deep reinforcement learning, we try to also tie back to fundamental uh, breakthroughs and challenges in uh, normal multi-agent reinforcement learning. Uh, my course will absolutely go into RL. Um, it probably should not be an intro RL class because it's assuming you know some stuff, but you are welcome to look at the slides. You're welcome to look at the uh, videos and decide if it's going to be interesting for you. Yeah, so application in healthcare. So uh, almost out of time. So applications in healthcare, you could think of treatments. So I have a patient who's presenting with something. Which of these three drugs or these three tests do I want to apply? I get the result back of that test, or I see how that drug influenced the patient. Now, what do I want to do? So that's absolutely you you're have a patient who has some state, and you can take different actions that gets you more, more information, and that gets you a reward. So it can absolutely be used in, in uh, healthcare, it can be used in education. Um, and yes, and Hari, Hari reminds you that as soon as we're done, you should definitely drop your emails so you can win a gift card. Okay, I think the last, the last the question I'll take just really quickly. Uh, tutoring is cool. Uh, yes. Uh, so anyone who would like to talk to me later, please just drop me an email. You could find it on IRLL.ca. And we are out of time. So I'm going to stop talking. Thank you so much uh, for your questions. This was a lot more fun than just staring at a blank screen. Thank you very much. Yeah. So on behalf of IEEE and professionals, Vinsa section, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Professor Matt for the very uh, good and insightful presentation. We really enjoyed it. I appreciate your time for joining us today near BC schedule. Thank you so much, Professor Matt. I may like to express my sincere thanks to Dr. Mujtaba, Vice Chair, IEEE Windsor Section for guiding us and leading us in the right path. I also wish to express my gratitude to Dr. Shivakumar, Dr. Vijayan, all faculties and students of St. Joseph's College of Engineering for joining this event. Finally, we have 10 gift cards that will be rolled out to 10 random participants in the coming weeks. So kindly drop your email IDs in the chat window. Once again, thanks to everyone for joining today's event. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for hosting me. This was really fun.